Welcome to Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. On this podcast, we'll be discussing nonviolent readings of Latter-day Saint scripture. I'm Dan, and I'm joined by my wife and co-host, Marianne. The Latter-day Peace Studies Project is born out of a desire to proclaim peace by providing an opportunity to approach religion, scripture, and relationships with God in a peaceful way. As we develop peace within ourselves first, we can reflect peace into the world around us. The Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me podcast seeks to assist listeners in their approach to scripture by providing nonviolent interpretation. Our hope is that we can integrate the teachings of the scriptures into our efforts to find peace within ourselves and proclaim peace in the world. Hello and welcome back to Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me. I'm your co-host, Dan. And I'm your co-host, Marianne. And this week, we get uh, a little bit of everything in terms of, you know, we get a little narrative, we get a little poem, we get a little Old Testament reference, we get a little... There's a whole bunch that's happening in here. Some transition chapters, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Nephi, maybe recognizing like, hey, you do need a bit of histor- historical context to understand these things. So even though I've written a lot of them in the large plates, let's get some in the small plates, just in case. Well, we begin chapter three with uh, Lehi quoting from a prophecy from Joseph in Egypt. And this is a prophecy that is not recorded in the version of the Old Testament that we have today. So we assume that it comes from the brass plates, but that it wasn't something kept by those who compiled the Old Testament. So that's pretty interesting. Yes, I know that some people have pointed to Genesis 49:22, which says uh, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. They've kind of suggested that maybe that's a, maybe that's a reference to this. And I think I, I don't remember if it's Genesis 49 or somewhere else, but in the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, I think he makes a little bit of an expansion that doesn't exactly match the one that Lehi is given here, uh, which is just Kind of interesting. Uh, might be worth comparing and contrasting those. But yeah, jo- Joseph and Joseph have a few uh, interesting parallels, both being last born sons who get to the promised land, right? Well, one tiny note Joseph of Egypt was not technically the last born. That's true. His younger brother, Benjamin, was the last born. But... Uh, he was the last born before he got to the the land promised to him. Right. So Benjamin was born <laughs> once right. he was there. So, yeah, so you're you're correct though that uh, not not quite the exact last born, which is interesting also because I've heard some some people suggest that Jacob and Joseph, as in Lehi's sons, were twins, and that they use the the naming pattern. Because Joseph is older than Jacob, is that right? Jacob's older than Joseph. So Jacob's older than Joseph, but that's right. Because if you look at this, it's pretty clear that Joseph was a very important name. One that Lehi, after getting the brass plates, probably would have wanted to use. And so he would he have waited to use it in the case of him maybe getting another kid or... If he knew he had twins, then he would feel comfortable naming one Jacob and the other Joseph. A little, a little bit of, uh, uh, I think, a, a few steps in logic that you need to make there. <laughs> but interesting, at least. I mean, it brings a lot of modern assumptions to it, really. Correct, yeah. You know, in terms of what you like for names and, and that sort yeah. of thing. Well, but Joseph Smith was named after his father, but he was not the firstborn son. He was the third born son. So why did his father wait till a third child to name one after him? Well, because Alvin was going to die, right? And, and before... Hiram? I, I, no, no. I was just trying to think why it, would, yeah. why it couldn't have been Hiram, but... Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yep. Timing-wise, I guess Hiram didn't work. So he just knew that <laughs> Joseph was, uh, was the one. I don't know. But, uh, I mean, getting into this blessing, the phrase in verse 3, he says, And now, Joseph, my lastborn, who I brought out of the wilderness of mine afflictions, may the Lord bless thee forever, for thy seed shall not utterly be destroyed. That is not the most rosy blessing. (laughs) It's like, well, some some will survive, but that's still a blessing, right? Especially compared to what we know from, from Nephi, where his whole, his whole offspring will, will dwindle in unbelief. So, yeah, this, that, brings in that that's how we lead into this discussion of of Joseph in Egypt where we get the information about the prophecy and 
You know, the prophecy, it's, it's interesting how this goes. And I think I say it's interesting too much, but it, tr- it truly is. Verse six, for Joseph truly testified saying, a seer shall the Lord my God raise up, who shall be a choice seer unto the fruit of my loins. And then we see that choice seer mentioned and seer is, is continually mentioned uh, in terms of all these things. He'll be great like Moses. Oh, by the way, Moses is a, a guy who I'm going to raise up to deliver people out of the land of Egypt, which I think is an interesting little way to bring in prophecy where you name something that's going to happen and then you realize that actually without context, that's not going to make a lot of sense. Yeah. Because <laughs> if, if Joseph just gets up and says, I'm, there's, there will be a choice seer for my loins who will be like Moses. It's like, well, okay, who's Moses? <laughs> <laughs> a little anachronistic there, I can see. But I mean, is there any, you know, the okay, the the fruit of thy loins shall write, and the fruit of the loins of Judah shall write, and they will be brought. You know, those writings will be brought. They shall grow together under the confounding of false doc- doctrines and laying down of contentions and establishing peace among the fruit of thy loins. And this last part, you know, ties back into the purpose of the Book of Mormon, as stated in the title page bringing them to the knowledge of their fathers and also to the knowledge of the covenants. I think that's a great list too of just promises from reading the Book of Mormon, that that's what the Book of Mormon is for, is to confound false doctrines and lay down contentions and establish peace of a special interest to us among the fruit of thy loins and bring them to the knowledge of their fathers in the latter days and also to the knowledge of my covenants, saith the Lord. So that's a great list of those things that we can expect to find in the Book of Mormon and that the Book of Mormon seeks to establish. There's, yeah, I, I, th- I think you're right. Other things that come out of this, that seer should will the Lord bless and they that seek to destroy him will be confounded. For this promise which I have obtained of the Lord of the fruit of my loins shall be fulfilled. Behold, I am sure of the fulfilling of this promise. This is one of those things that comes up again and again in the Book of Mormon. We'll see this like with Enos, where it's like, well, I've got this promise from the Lord, and so I have this confidence, right? Lehi mentions, you know, once he gets the the promise from the Lord, that he has confidence. And that'll come up again and again, just this idea of, well, we, we have the covenant, right? And that is what brings us surety and peace, which I think is not always something that it's sometimes hard to feel, right? It's like, well, I know I have the covenant, right? But what's the difference between having the covenant and feeling the confidence from that covenant? I don't know. It's good to look back and, and think a little bit more on that, you know, about how our covenants actually impact our attitudes and behavior. Well, the hope, I think, is that the covenant, the covenant isn't any good if we don't have faith in the Lord. And by faith, I mean trust. If you don't trust the Lord... Making a covenant with him doesn't do anything for you, either in the accomplishing of the covenant or even just in the making of it. Whereas if you trust the person that you make a covenant with, that covenant gives you confidence. I mean, think of that in terms of a marriage covenant, that you have to trust that person you're making that promise with. And if you do, just the making of the covenant gives you peace. It's true. Even as it takes time to fulfill. Yes, I I think maybe it's a little easier to get lost sort of in the modern context, but I think at least anciently, you know, so much depended on your word, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that too. And then we get to the transition where we we get interesting little preview into the future because uh, this part appears to be referencing Joseph Smith because it turns out, oh, this seer, well, his name shall be called after me, me being Joseph in Egypt, uh, and it shall be after the name of his father. Obviously, we just mentioned how... Joseph Smith Sr., named Joseph Smith Jr., uh, and he took a couple couple kids before he got there, but uh, still named him after himself. And he shall be like unto me, for the thing which the Lord shall bring forth by his hand, by the power of the Lord, shall bring my people unto salvation. So whether that is a reference to the church or the Book of Mormon, I'm not sure that that's exactly clear here. Probably the Book of Mormon. Well, the Book of Mormon is certainly part of the Restoration, but it's not the entirety of the Restoration, right? It's, it's true. But I'm wondering, here's where I would raise my, like, hey, there's some weird, interesting grammatical things. Because we have a lot of pronouns in these, right? We get Lehi saying, and thus prof- prophesied Joseph, saying, behold, that seer of the Lord bless. And then he says, again, he says, behold, I am sure of the fulfilling of this promise is that behold coming from Joseph or is that behold coming from Lehi? Not very clear. Obviously, we don't have dialogue tags. 
but it did then it does say and his name shall be ca- called after me but is that him is that lehi going back to quoting him or is that a continuation of what joseph was saying because it's sandwiched between two that are clear two statements that are clearly first person from joseph i think we have to assume that it continues there but you are correct that that's not that's an assumption that we make right it's not explicit because you would assume the same thing with verse 12 and 13 except then we get in 14 and thus prophesied joseph suggesting that some of this is coming from lehi well we have to be mindful of all of these levels of i mean we're at like fourth person by now right so we're getting it from nephi quoting lehi quoting joseph of egypt and so we're like the fourth step removed at least by that well and lehi's quoting the brass plates quoting yes. joseph of egypt so we have several layers there to consider there's definitely more than one <laughs> <laughs> so the, the interesting ambiguity at least suggests that you know whether the thing the lord shall bring forth if that's referencing back to verse 12 where it talks about the fruit of the loin shall write you know those ones or if it's a reference to the whole of the restoration this is i think that there's there's room for both interpretations maybe lean more towards the restoration well we have another example of that in verse 16 because he starts yea thus prophesied joseph i am sure of this thing even as i am sure of the promise of moses so that that seems to be another direct quote from joseph of egypt so his i am sure of the fulfilling of this promise in 14 i mean he just said it again so <laughs> Yes. And this one more explicitly. So Now, there is a interesting tradition I've only briefly done some research on, and uh, there's there's been a handful of LDS scholars who have delved a little more deeply into it, the idea of the Messiah ben Joseph, which we're familiar with the Messiah ben David. That's what, what Christians accept as Jesus Christ, right? He's of the house of David. He, he came to redeem us. But there is some evidence that there are traditions of a second Messiah, right? The the Messiah ben Joseph. This is Matthew Brown. He says, according to Jewish lore, the Messiah ben Joseph concept first arose when Rachel, the mother of the Joseph of Egypt, prophesied that Joseph would be the ancestor of Messiah who would arise at the end of days. And, you know, it's got some interest for, for Latter-day Saints. Jewish legends claim that Joseph of Egypt uttered prophecies about the Messiah ben Joseph that might, you know, for us kind of back up some of these prophecies that are in the Book of Mormon. And there are there are points in the legend of the Messiah ben Joseph that seem maybe to correspond to the life of Joseph Smith. I'm, this is where it gets a little bit more speculative. And I've, I've read some LDS discussion of it that says, well, actually, it's, you know, not that close. But there's more than one tradition. So it's like, well, he lines up with this one. He doesn't line up with that one. The point is there's room for interpretation. But it's interesting, at least, to say that there's this ancient tradition that just so happens to be mentioned in the early parts of the Book of Mormon. You know what else I find interesting about that? Is that all of the prophecies about the Messiah Ben David are from men, and this prophecy comes from Rachel, a woman. Just just an interesting foil, perhaps, to the matriarchal and patriarchal views of history and prophesying, Rachel prophesying about her children. I think that's really interesting to consider. I really love that tradition and those implications. And now the sort of prophecy, again, we get a little ambiguity. Is this Lehi or does this continuing Joseph? A little bit hard to say. I lean towards this being more towards Lehi, maybe still quoting Joseph at points or quoting the brass plates and other points. Uh, with verse 17, you know, where he says, I will raise up a Moses and I will give him power into a rod and give him judgment in writing. So... This seems to be also referencing this other Joseph, maybe. It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, Yet I will not lose his tongue that he shall speak much, for I will not make him mighty in speaking. That's where you're like, well, if all this was referring to Joseph Smith, then I mean, Joseph Smith seemed to have some oratorical powers, or oratory power. How, how would you say that? <laughs> powers of oration. Powers of oration. But uh, we get in verse 18, a very interesting verse. And the Lord said to me also, I raise up the fruit of thy loins, and I will make for him a spokesman. And behold, I will give him that he shall write the writing of the fruit of thy loins under the fruit of thy loins, and the spokesman of thy, thy loins shall declare it. Very weird verse here, grammatically, I think. 
And in reading some of these commentaries, people were like, well, this is still Joseph. Some people were like, well, maybe it was Sidney Rigdon or maybe it was Oliver Cowdery or Bruce R. McConkey said it might be Mormon that compiled the Book of Mormon, right? And so he's of the fruit of the loins and that Joseph is the spokesman for Mormon. Ah, that's very interesting. Honestly, listen, I know that I've given Bruce R. McConkey some uh, some flack in my day, but I like that interpretation. Yeah, that's really interesting. To me, that's a, I don't know, the, the idea of that being the case ties Joseph into the Book of Mormon in a much less, I know some people have, some detractors have accused this of being a self-insert on Joseph's part, but right. um, this seems more like a, instead of a self-insert, it's more of a, a accreditation, right? Uh, he's including himself in the et al. portion of the, the pa- paper, you might say, but uh, hard, hard, to, hard to say uh, exactly uh, what's going on. And then we're going to get some more stuff in the rest of this prophecy that, again, is a little bit left up to interpret has a bunch of different interpretations where I think the majority of people still believe that this is probably Joseph. We get some prophecies about the Book of the Mormon. You know, the fruit of thy loins had cried unto them from the dust, right? Uh, they shall cry unto the dust, even, even repentance unto the brethren. One comment on uh, verse 20, it seems like there's maybe a, a word deleted there. So I added it in on uh, the Royal Skousen's analysis where, and it shall come to pass that their cry shall go, even according to the simpleness of their words. Seems like it should say go forth, right? Go, go even according to the simpleness of the words does not seem like the phrase that would fit here based off other things in the Book of Mormon, which again, I just really am appreciating Royal Skousen's insights because that is such a small thing, but for me, when I put in go forth, right, it, it just, it, the flow felt much more like the scriptures feel, and it seemed to it seemed to capture something that wasn't there before, and it's so interesting how just a little word, or as we've mentioned before, like punctuation, can change our understanding, our conceptualization of the scriptures. So just another endorsement of Royal Skousen's earliest book. And grammar itself. Grammar is powerful. Yes. The more that I'm looking at at these verses again with the lens that it could be Mormon as the fruit of thy loins and then Joseph being the spokesman, it's really making a lot of sense to me. I am liking that interpretation more and more. I'm going to have to keep reading it to see how well that lays with me. Okay, so verse 22, we get Lehi pretty clearly. And now behold, my son Joseph, after this manner did my father of old prophesy, suggesting that a lot of this has been Joseph, but it doesn't, a lot of this doesn't really seem to have been Joseph. It seems like Lehi is being very, um, what would be the word, like exegetical or or prophetically adapting it, maybe might, might be the right idea. Well, he does seem to be on his deathbed. So making a paraphrase is a bit in his prerogative right there, right? <laughs> I, I think that that's, yes. But verse, so 22, he finishes 23, for thy covenant thou art blessed, thy seed shall not be destroyed, which this covenant seems to be, maybe this is kind of hidden in here, is like, well, what covenant did Joseph of Egypt had? He had the covenant from the Lord, but where did he get it from? He got it from Abraham, right? Like, you can trace that back to Abraham. So, surprise, surprise, this is actually tying into the Abrahamic covenant, which ties back into Joseph Smith. Right. So uh, this is a covenant that transcends time and space that basically genericized might teach us that those who choose to follow God have a promised land. Right. Geospatially, maybe not, you know, a specific promised land, but just promised land generally, and that they also have the preservation of their seed, right, their offspring or however you might conceptualize that, as well as the introduction of sacred records. So there, there's a lot, I think, that's kind of buried in the subtext of this. But verse 24, which I got to speak on, because this is one that just, just reading, there shall rise up one mighty among them who shall do good, both in word and deed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A lot of commentaries suggest that this is still Joseph Smith, right? This has all been looking towards Joseph Smith. And this is just Lehi sort of reiterating that point of what's going to happen in the future. But Spencer W. Kimball basically believed that this would be a Native American prophet. And whether that means 
capital pre P profit, like profit of the church, or simply, you know, a, a prophetic figure among the Native Americans. I, I don't know that he's ever, you know, I don't know that he clarified. And I don't even know that that's a well accepted uh, interpretation of this anymore. But it's one I really like, and I think makes sense with all that we've been saying. Well, in the verse before that, he says, for thy seed shall not be destroyed, for they shall hearken unto the words of the book. And then 24, and there shall rise up one mighty among them. So that among whom? Joseph's seed. So to me, that, that does indicate that it has to be a descendant of Joseph, the son of Lehi. Yes. However, the the counterpoint in reading is that, well, yes, Joseph ben Lehi, right, is is of Joseph's seed. And Joseph ben Joseph, Joseph Smith, is also of Joseph's seed, right, based off his patriarchal blessing. So, mm-hmm. and I think that's that's the counterpoint. It's like, well... You know, among your seed, well, you're you're tied back into all of this, so maybe not directly through you, but I don't know. I have my own personal preference uh, for for what it would be, but I, I I would not impose that upon others. Well, I love that um, Lehi before his death he reiterates again in verse four: the For the Lord God hath said that inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land; and inasmuch as ye will not keep my commandments, ye shall be cut off from my presence. And I believe that promise is reiterated over 30 times in the course of the Book of Mormon. And it's so central to the message of the Book of Mormon that every time I come across it, I, tr- I try to take a moment to think about what that actually means. And I have to be honest, I'm not sure about all the implications of that promise yet. I'm still thinking about that one because it's not everything's going to be fine if you keep the commandments and it's not immediate. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out if it doesn't mean that, what does it mean? So when he speaks to Laman and Lemuel's children, he leaves them a blessing and he says, uh, wherefore thou shalt not utterly be destroyed, but in the end thy seed shall be blessed. So again, that it's this, what does that promise mean? And then he spake unto the sons of Ishmael and yea, even all his household. So it finishes up with, he just, he sort of speaks to everyone. I find it interesting at this juncture to note that the deaths of Ishmael and Lehi are noted in the text, but the deaths of Ishmael's wife, who does come with him into the wilderness, she is mentioned. So he didn't come like as a widower or something. So the death of Ishmael's wife and the death of Sariah are not mentioned. We don't know when those occurred at what point. And that seems to be another important thing that's missing in this text. That's something that we don't have that, again, makes it feel a bit unbalanced to me. That's a a very good point in terms of what we're missing. One thing in verse three that's interesting is it says, he called the children of Laman his sons and his daughters. Depending on how you interpret that, you know, that might be a a way of reiterating that phrase. He called the children of Laman, who are his children, his sons and his daughters. Or it might be saying that Lehi called them his sons and daughters and that he's doing and, you know, he says, behold, my sons and daughters. So I think that that is the right way to interpret it. It's Grant Hardy pointed out that Lehi might be here sort of adopting Laman's children as, as his own children to replace the rebellious father right? That this is in his final moments. That's one of the blessings that he's going to extend to them is to have the removal of that connection, right? Leapfrogging the generation. Yeah. Trying to be a good grandpa and maintain those relationships, even as I think he can sense that more of those relationships are about to be severed. So after Lehi dies and is buried, not many days after his death, Laman and Lemuel and the sons of Ishmael were angry with me, this is Nephi speaking, because of the admonitions of the Lord. For I, Nephi, was constrained to speak unto them according to his word. So I wonder what this looked like if this was Nephi falling back into his old patterns. (laughs) Or if it was, I mean, probably a little bit of both, but of Laman and Lemuel falling back into old patterns of Nephi literally can't say anything to them without them getting defensive and upset and it riling up their pride. I can really see there being two sides to this coin here. And just as he is describing, like in verse 14 and 15, just as he's describing this like really painful moment, being in such grief, and then to have these old wounds with his brothers opened up again, he initiates his um, move into a psalm, and he writes some poetry for us about his difficulties and his perceptions of himself 
I really think we only get this much introspection from a writer in the scriptures from the original Psalms from David, if David did indeed write all of the Psalms. And so you really get a view of how Nephi views himself and how he feels about himself and his frustrations. This makes him feel so very human to me. This makes him so real. And in verse 18, when he says, I am encompassed about because of the temptations and the sins which do so easily beset me. And, you know, that that could be everything from the conflict with his brothers to his own pride to falling back in his own defensiveness against his brothers. And, you know, he's no more and no less than fully human. And he's really recognizing it here. But then in, in verse 19, and when I desire to rejoice, my heart groaneth because of my sins. Nevertheless, I know in whom I have trusted. And just in a, as in a classic psalm, he moves from the sorrow and recognition of his own fallen state to praise for the Lord and the ways that the Lord has delivered him. And he lists those out and talks about all of the ways that the Lord has blessed him and shown mercy to him. And we see in verse 26 that he, the things that he knows because of his experiences with the Lord, he doesn't always make choices consistent with that right? He says, why should my heart weep and my soul linger in the valley of sorrow because of my afflictions? And just knowing the truth and even having a relationship with God doesn't always mean we're going to be happy <laughs> and doesn't always mean that we make those best choices, right? People are generally smart, but they don't tend to always do what they know is good for them. And so we see Nephi really struggling with this very human thing of, I know what I should do, but I don't always do it. Why don't I always do it? It's very Pauline. In that way, that which I know to do, I would not do, and that which I don't want to do, I do. Is that Paul? Is that Paul or Augustine? It's one of those. Guys. No, that's Paul. That's okay. for sure, Paul. I, I'm sure Augustine said the exact same thing, though. Yes, probably. I don't know. Are there any particular verses in this Psalm of Nephi that speak to you? I have two things that I, I want to kind of focus on. The first is another connection back to the Old Testament and Old Testament language. When he says, behold, my soul delighteth in the things of the, this is verse 16, where he says, behold, my soul delighteth in the things of the Lord and my heart pondereth continually upon the things that I have seen and heard. This is a very interesting way of Nephi personifying parts of his own self that you have my soul, which would be, you know, nefesh, it would be the holy life breath delighting in the things of the Lord. And then, you know, the heart, my heart pondering and like the difference between your soul and your heart, what ways you might divide that up. My soul delighteth. That's something that only Nephi uses in, in the Book of Mormon, which I think is very interesting. The other thing, well, I've got maybe a couple more things. Um, <laughs> the other thing, verse 18, where he talks about being encompassed about, and then we get verse 33, where he says, O Lord, will thou encircle me in the robes of thy righteousness? So at first he's encompassed about by temptations and sins that easily beset him. And then in 33, it's almost like a conclusion or an answer to that, where now instead of being encircled by sins and temptations, he's encircled in the robes of righteousness, right? Which is connected to the idea of kafar, which is Hebrew for cover over or what we translate sometimes as atonement, right? It's a, it's a way to escape. And this robe of righteousness, right? Encircling him kind of brings you back to the idea of like the tabernacle, right? It's a, it's a place that encircles us. It's, it's the encircling of, you know, the, the walls of the temple, right? It's being encircled in a hug, right? It's being brought into that embrace, which I think is important. I had heard that the phrase, encircle me around in the robe of thy righteousness, that that's referring to a Middle Eastern expression of hospitality. Yes. Yeah. I think I know for sure Nibley mentions that, and I'm sure other people do as well. Oh, one, one more thing, uh, because in verse 15, going back to the beginning, he talks about, again, my soul delighteth in the scriptures, my heart pondereth them, and writeth them for the learning and profit. And so... We had mentioned earlier the pattern that Nephi follows where he's desired to see the thing his father's seen, where he ponders, where he seeks after these things. And it's almost like this is the more, you know, mature way of him learning is that now he's he's delighting in these things 
He's still pondering, but now he's writing. So there's an expansion. It's not just something that he's receiving, right? It's something that he's able to now generate and send forth. And I think that that reflects a little bit more spiritual maturity from Nephi. And maybe we're maybe we've seen that in the the small plates. That he's gone from, he's had a lot of experience with the large plates where he's been writing the history. And maybe now he's, you know, in his 50s or 60s even. Now he's writing the things that are of most worth to his soul. And so maybe he knows that I used to just, you know, want and seek. But now I'm, I'm getting these things and I have the ability to ponder them in my heart. And now my duty is really to share and bless others, to write these things. Right. So I think that there's a good case to be made that this is a progression of Nephi's spiritual maturity. Yeah, I really agree with that. One other small note, because <laughs> I, I can't not include more. There is some evidence to suggest that Nephi is patterning his psalm off of Zenos's prayer, which we get Zenos's prayer over in Alma 33, which is quoted, obviously, there. I went and made a, a little chart that shows, you know, what, what the comparisons are. So if anyone wants that, I just let us know in the Latter Day Peace Studies uh, Facebook group, and uh, I, I will be happy to share that. So I also love in verse 34, when he expresses, O Lord, I have trusted in thee, and I will trust in thee forever. I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh, for I know that cursed is he that putteth his trust in the arm of flesh. Yea, cursed is he that putteth his trust in man, or maketh flesh his arm. Reading this verse really reminded me of the talk from Spencer W. Kimball about the, the false gods we worship and about trusting in the arm of flesh. The contrast that we have there with Nephi expressing his trust in the Lord and just in the Lord. And he knows there's there's not really anything else we can trust in the world. And that's why anyone who trusts in anyone or anything other than God is cursed is because none of those things or people or ideas can save. None of them have really any lasting power. Beautiful. Does that bring us to chapter five? It does indeed. First thing that I want to notice is that chapter five, after verse one, verse two through four are a little chiasmus. I just saw that and I was like, this is such a weird thing to make a chiasmus because normally with the chiasmic structure, you're trying to create a central thesis, right? That things build up to and that central thesis is the focus. But in this case, if you read verses two through four, We've got, <laughs> seek to take away my life, murmur against me, younger brother thinks to rule over us, we've had much trial before him, and the sinner is, now let us slay him. And then it's afflicted because of his words, we will not have him to be a ru our ruler, murmured against me, seek to take away my life. Which is, I, I don't know, it's, uh, perhaps Nephi has just gotten so into the chiastic structure that he can't help himself, but that's an interesting way, and maybe what it is. And again, maybe this is I'm putting on my speculation hat is maybe he's trying to emphasize because what what happens next, right? They leave and they leave after Lehi dies and after there's this great falling out. And so maybe Nephi is taking the time to point to this as like, why am I leaving with my family? Well, because they're going to kill me, right? Yeah, to emphasize the, the seriousness of the issue, he's not leaving because he doesn't like his brothers anymore. He's leaving literally to save his life. It has always struck me when I read through this chapter that he's, he says, I, Nephi, in verse 5, um, should depart from them and flee into the wilderness and all those who would go with me. And he lists out some specifically, I, Nephi, did take my family and also Zoram and his family and Sam, my elder brother and his family, Jacob and Joseph, my younger brethren, and also my sisters his first and only mention of his sisters, and all those who would go with me. And all those who would go with me were those who believed in the warnings and the revelations of God, wherefore they did hearken unto my words. And it strikes me every time I read this that it's unlikely that the split happened cleanly along sibling descendant lines. I've always wondered if there were any of Laman and Lemuel, any of their children, any of the sons of Ishmael's children who chose to go with Nephi and any of Nephi or Sam or Zoram's descendants who chose not to leave and just what a difficult split this really is and how much grief it must have caused Nephi. This is another trauma. He Like they had to leave Jerusalem and live in the wilderness and cross the ocean to get to the promised land and he's still not done. 
running for his life. He has to do this again. I just can't imagine how difficult that must have felt for him and all those who were with him. Yeah. As to the identity of Nephi's sisters, you might wonder, okay, is this are these born from Lehi and Sariah? Or are these maybe that layman Lamuel split? I know that's just kind of reiterating what you just said. But the interesting thing in there for me is, first off, Sam comes with them. And I think this is the last time that Sam gets mentioned. If it's not the last time, it's nearly the last time that he gets mentioned in the Book of Mormon. And there's never any Samites in the Book of Mormon, but there are Nephites and Jacobites and Josephites and Ishmaelites and Zoramites and all manner of ites, as they mentioned. But I, I read in the interesting suggestion that Sam may have only had daughters or may not have had children. Maybe it mentions Sam having children at some point. I, I don't. It doesn't ring a bell off the top of my head. And uh, were you not looking for that? I don't know that that's something you'd notice in a read through. Perhaps my next read through, that's a question that I'll bring. But the other phrase in there that's after he says, my sister, he says, and all those who would go with me. Well, he's mentioned, just to say it again, Zoram and Sam and Jacob and Joseph and his sisters. So who are all all those who would go with him? This is, I think, the verse that a lot of people like to point to, myself included, to say, hey, look, we do have a little bit of a hint of other contact, right? Of some people who are not of Lehi's group that they meet very soon and begin integrating with. And I imagine there's some integration among the Lamanites, and there's some integration among the Nephites. And this split, some portion of them would have gone with with Nephi and his brethren. There's a couple other things that that get mentioned that might suggest that same thing. But the the idea that they've met non-Hebrew natives, I think, at least gets introduced there. I just did a cursory search for mention of the children of Sam. And he never addressed, Lehi never addresses them in his going through his descendants. He speaks to Sam, but he doesn't speak to Sam's children. And the only mention that it has is that Sam, you know, in verse six of chapter five, Sam, mine elder brother and his family. But I mean, that doesn't necessarily have to be children. It could be him and his wife. So anyway, just just a a note there. Good. I like to get some things right. (laughs) And it's my job to check it. Yes. All right. Verse 10, where it talks about, so they've gone to the the land of Nephi, right? They name it after Nephi and they call themselves the people of Nephi. You know, verse 10, they they did observe to keep the judgments and the statutes and the commandments of the Lord and all things according to the law of Moses. This is one of the biggest questions for me about the Book of Mormon, because Nephi says this and he's writing in the small plates where he's keeping track of the most spiritual things, but he never mentions what the judgments and statues and commandments are that they're following. We get almost no insight into what this entails. There's a handful of mentions of sacrifices earlier in First Nephi, and we'll get it later with, I think, around King Benjamin. And from time to time, you'll get little hints and pieces. But even later in the Book of Mormon, where it talks about how they endeavored to keep the law of Moses, right? Looking forward to Christ. We don't know what that means when they say that. We barely get any hints of holy days, right? They've identified maybe in Mosiah, we get Sukkot. But it's almost like this is the world that they're swimming in. And they don't quote David Foster Wallace, and this is water. You know, the fish don't realize that they're in water, right? That it's such a context around them that they don't even realize, like, this is just what we do, right? And I don't know that that's exactly what's going on here, but it drives me wild that we don't know what, like, when he says judgments, commands you, statues, Nephi, give me a couple. Like, what do you mean? Because we look back to what we have in the Old Testament, and that comes from the Josiah reforms, right? Which Nephi and his family left at or around those times, And I think we've got a good case to make that some of their leaving is a response to those things. So it's probably not that they're keeping all of the statutes and judgments and commandments that Josiah brought up with the new Deuteronomy, right? Maybe there's um, there's going to be a lot of overlap, I imagine, because I don't think Josiah I don't think Josiah invented it out of whole cloth. That that I think is a ridiculous idea that no one believes. But it's the question of well, what was in the brass plates? that was preserved as these things 
Yeah, that is really interesting about how he doesn't bother to mention their specific religious practices because it, it would be like talking about how to drive a car nowadays. It's like, well, everybody knows that, I guess. It would be a statement you would make for comic effect in a book where it's like, I took a car to, you know, I took a car to the grocery store. By the way, a car is this four wheeled automobile with an engine that makes it go. And a grocery yeah. store is a place <laughs> where you can go buy food stuff. It's just, you wouldn't need to explain that. So, yeah. And he wouldn't really have the, con like, we have the context now of, or the idea of imagining, like, explain it to me like I'm an alien. But that wouldn't, <laughs> that wouldn't have been possible for Nephi to imagine any type of cultural context really outside of his own, because his exposure to it would have been so limited as to make that nearly impossible. I also think it's really interesting in this chapter that he mentions taking the sword of Laban, and after the manner that did make many swords, then in verse 15... He says, I did teach my people to build buildings and to work in all manner of wood and of iron and of copper and of brass and of steel and of gold and of silver and of precious ores, which were in great abundance. So he talks about wood and then he mentions seven different types of metal. So this is just, I mean, this to me, this is just heaping more evidence on Nephi had training in metallurgy and the metals and ore that were around and available and how to work with each, that, that was something that he knew deeply and was very important to him and that he taught his people how to do. That was knowledge that he brought with him to the new world. So Yes, I think uh, one thing that might be worth noting is that in verse 12, we get that Nephi is bringing with him the plates of brass and the liahona, and we've got the mention of the sword. And the sword plates and liahona are the Nephite relics, right? They're the big things that go with them and added onto them will be the Urim and Thummim, which will be the things that Joseph Smith eventually gets with the gold plates in that stone box. And so I think that those items again, I know I reference back to this book all the time, but Don Bradley's lost 116 pages. He suggests that these items are going to essentially be the items that are representing the things that would have been in the ark right? Because we learned that Nephi built a temple after the pattern of Solomon. So if he does that, there's probably an ark in there, right? And what's going to be in the ark? Well, instead of the stone tablets for the commandments, we've got the liahona, right? Which had the writing of the finger of God. We've got the liahona also to represent the manna. It, it, he goes through the whole list of what all these things might then represent. But I think at least they represent, right, the right of governance, which Nephi is going to reference back again a little bit later. Well, not just right of governance, but how they got here. Right. Right? Like their journey through the wilderness that brought them to this place. Yes. And again, there's some interesting kind of, there's some subtext that's going on here that maybe is mentioned more in the large plates. But when he talks about building a temple, he says, well, we don't have so many precious things. And it's like, well, Nephi, you were just telling us about how you had all these ores, right? And, and super abundance. Okay, so the suggestion that I read is that, you know, the these precious things are probably like the gems, the gemstones and the fine linens and the dyed wools and those sorts of things. Yes, not Not yeah. the... The metal, which was, I don't think, necessarily iconic of the tabernacle. or Metal would have been much more of a useful thing and not an ornamental thing, especially at this stage in their civilization, I would think. Yes. Before we get too far away from it, I do want to go back to verse 14, when Nephi uses the sword of Laban as the template and makes more swords. Mm -hmm. Lest by any means the people who are now called Lamanites should come upon us and destroy us. For I knew their hatred towards me and my children and those who are called my people. So they make swords for self-defense. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, I don't think it's good, but it's understandable. And we get a little bit later, Nephi says, they, they would that I should be their king. And he says, but I don't want them to have a king. So I wonder how much of this is they desired to have some way to defend themselves but I didn't want them to be warlike people. Nevertheless, I did according to what was in my power. So I'm wondering also if patterning those those swords after the Sword of Laban was another way to make those swords within Nephi's realm. Like Nephi had the Sword of Laban and he got it by means of killing Laban. And so that legitimizes his right to the sword and he takes it with him and then he makes more of them so that his people can defend themselves. But last chapter, he just got finished saying that he trusts in the Lord 
and he won't put his trust in the arm of flesh. And making a lot of swords certainly seems like trusting in the arm of flesh and not trusting that the Lord led them away and that the Lord would protect them. So I agree. I think maybe this is, it could be coming from Nephi, but it could also be coming from his people. But I had another question on on that idea of Nephi as king in verse 18. So he says the people wanted him to be their king, but he was desirous that they should have no king. And then he says, nevertheless, I did for them according to that which was in my power. So that statement has me saying, so did he become their king? (laughs) See, like, I became king even though I didn't want to. Or does he say, I decided that we shouldn't have a king, but I basically fulfilled the functions of a king. You know, which is it? Did he become their king or did he not? Yeah, I think most people point to him being a king right? Whether in name or in effect. We also have him setting apart Jacob and Joseph as as priests. And there's this idea of, you know, kings and priests that you're splitting up sort of the authorities. I don't know. John Welch and I think John Lundquist, they do say like, hey, you know, these are the things that kings do in sort of like big speeches. You know, they cite their calling as divine, issue new laws, ordain officers, erect monuments, and maybe establish like a new covenant. Those are all things Nephi does, right? <laughs> you know, building the temple, the king building the temple, I think is is that definitely ties him into other historical kings. Whether he would go by King Nephi, I think you got that might be something that he didn't want to do, but probably let his people <laughs> call him King Nephi. Yeah. Hard, hard to say, but good, good, good question. And yeah, it's interesting because I don't think we ever explicitly get the, the, you know, King Nephi or... They crowned Nephi as king, but Mm -hmm. whether or not you crown a king, it seems like this is where he wound up. So he specifies in in verse 28 that 30 years had passed away from the time they left Jerusalem. And that's when the Lord tells him to make the small plates in verse 30. So he follows the commandments and, and makes the new plates and, you know, is filling them with the things that God commands him to. And... Then he says in verse 32, And I engraved that which is pleasing unto God. And if my people are pleased with the things of God, they will be pleased with mine engravings, which are upon these plates. And if my people desire to know the more particular part of the history of my people, they must search mine other plates. So this indicates to me that Nephi believed at this time that these writings were for his descendants, his people. Whereas later in the Book of Mormon, well, at least to the compiler, Mormon, he knows it's for us. He's compiling it for our day. But that wasn't necessarily important for Nephi to know at the time when he was making this record. So the Lord was just like, hey, make a record and fill it with the highlights, the very most important things, right? Which I think is also kind because it would be very overwhelming to, after keeping a journal for 30 years, be like, oh, hey, make another journal and like, make sure you include all the stuff that was in your 30 years worth of journal. (laughs) Okay. Well, to be fair, he skips over a lot of time in there. Yes, he does. That part is nice. I mean, no wonder he only includes, you know, those things that are of most worth because he'd already made a record. But he believes these to be for his people, right? This is for his his people's profit and learning, much the way that like the brass plates had been and like all of his experience with scripture, right? Is ancestors writing for their descendants for their benefit. And that is a purpose of the Book of Mormon, but it's not the only purpose of the Book of Mormon. But the whole purpose of the Book of Mormon doesn't seem to be revealed to all of the contributors to it. That seems to be some special knowledge that's given to Mormon and then Moroni, as Mormon is compiling the plates, because he he has to have a better idea of what this purpose is as he compiles all these records. And it wasn't necessarily important for each individual contributor to know that. And so I just thought that was an interesting, Nephi thinks that it's for his people, whereas later in the Book of Mormon, Mormon's like, oh, this isn't for these people right now. This is for their much further descendants and then for the Gentiles. And I find that really interesting. So some of the more challenging verses here in the Book of Mormon. Some problematic ones, at least the way that they have been read historically. I think we can in no way be exhaustive, but we can touch on them and sort of how we can take a peace-promoting view of these verses. So verse 20, we get, And as much as they will not hearken to the words, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. And behold, they were cut off from his presence. That cut off seems to be sort of the big turn here, where it's it's almost used for like dramatic effect. And of course, it comes right after Nephi mentions that they built a temple, and now he's been sort of chosen as ruler. And so part of, I think, the cutting off from the presence of the Lord is 
being cut off from the temple, right? And those blessings and the opportunity to get more revelation, right? As, as having spiritual leaders. And then we get the, the curse, right? This, this sore cursing that comes upon them. And then as a result of the curse, we have this side effect, right? Where, whereas they were white, they were exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people. The Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. First off, another endorsement for Grant's Har- Grant Hardy's annotated Book of Mormon. He does a great job on a note of this. Uh, I'm not going to read it all here, but he just covers very plainly. Hey, here's how it's been interpreted. Here's what we currently think. Obviously, he points out that this can't really be used as a justification for racism against African Americans because they were not African American or from Africa. They were not part of this story at this time. Right. So the, there's both modern injections of racism that you have to deal with and then also sort of understanding cultural ideas around dark skin, literally or metaphorically, that we have to see it from a lot of different ways. And it's not simple, right? But I think Nephi is using simple language that ties back into existing language about cursing and blessing being associated with darkness and whiteness. And we'll see that throughout the Book of Mormon. We'll see people talk about their garments being dyed in the blood of the Lamb to be made white. We've seen the fruit of the tree of life being white. Blessing is always going to be associated with white in the Book of Mormon. It's very explicit and constant and consistent. Whereas everything that's evil is dark and cursed and dreary. Well, except for the blood of the Lamb. Right, but... That's the dark thing. Well, when you wash it in the blood, your garments become white. Mm. So... That is a a little bit of a paradox. There are lots of theories for why this is happening, but I think one of the things that helps me is to remember that Nephi is coming from a world in which God causes all things. Things are ordered by God and, and they happen. And I think he's had that in his life too, where it's like, well, I obeyed and God blessed me. It's a natural thing to assume. So when Nephi sees an event happen or notices something happening, he's going to attribute that all to God. That's the context that he comes in. So whatever reality might be behind the skin darkening, however that might have happened, and whether that's literally having skin darkened through intermarriage or spending more time outside or through clothing themselves in animal cloaks instead of, you know, linens and raised flocks and and those sorts of things, whatever the the distinction might be, Nephi is going to attribute that all to God. And we'll see that time and time again, where God, because he is able to, accepts, at least you know passively, the violence or prejudicial racial attitudes of a culture, that projection and justification saying, well, the reason they're destroyed, well, God said that they were sinful. The reason that we get this over them, well, God loves us more. And it's a post hoc fallacy, or maybe not fallacy, but it's a post hoc rationalization Mm -hmm. of the facts. Well, because it's how things are, therefore it must be, it's how God wants it to be. Yes. To elaborate on this though, for as much of an issue as this is, simply saying this is Nephi noticing a racial difference or skin color difference actually doesn't answer the question because we're going to see throughout the Book of Mormon times when the Lamanites are righteous and when... The Nephites are wicked, and we're going to see Lamanites and Nephites working together. There's an incident when Captain Moroni searches among his troops for a descendant of the Lamanites. It's noticeable that he has to search among them. If you're following literally the idea that this skin curse is happening, you would think that you would not have to search, right? He would just pick out the one guy with dark skin. That does not happen. So there's more going on here than just simply, and especially, I would say, Joseph Smith wanted to justify the racist attitudes towards Native American Indians. I think that 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 is the one that that answers the fewest questions, even if that may be sort of the prevailing theory. We certainly can't remove the context that Joseph is translating in, but that also doesn't mean that that's the whole story. And I agree that there is much more nuance here. And if you look at the actual stories in the Book of Mormon about interactions between Nephites and Lamanites, it's clear that it's not simply a racial difference. 
And I, I say simply recognizing that that is often a very big difference. So that the question is always much bigger than that. And we do have to be careful not to, not only was this a long time ago, and so, you know, it's temporally a different context, but their cultural traditions are something that are really different to Americans of European descent, for example. And so our views about race, skin color, prejudice, all of that are colored by our own experiences and history and knowledge of the world, which they didn't necessarily share. Specifically, the American flavor of racism is actually pretty unique in the history of the world in a very terrible way. So I, I think that a lot of the attitudes that come through in Nephi writing about this, we could say that Nephi Nephi has some prejudice that's being displayed here, and also that he's attributing everything to the Lord's will. But also, I think if we leave it at that, we're doing a disservice to the text, and we need to be asking some harder questions that don't really come naturally to us. Well... I think that that is a good wrapping up point. Anything else in these chapters that you wanted to, to touch on? I don't think so. Like we said in the beginning, these are some real transition chapters as we kind of get in toward the Isaiah chapters and um, kind of establishing the Nephite myth of origin. Well, that's all for this week. Thank you for listening and thank you to our editors for their hard work. Uh, please make sure to go rate and review this podcast on your podcast platform of choice. And make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and also tell your friends about uh, our discussions so they can hear and uh, provide feedback as well. If you'd like to get involved in the Latter-day Peace Studies Project, you can join the Facebook group Latter-day Nonviolence, Pacifism, and Peace Studies. There are links in the show notes. Please make sure to check the Get Involved page to see how you can contribute regularly to cover the cost of hosting the podcast. The website is latterdaypeacestudies.org. I'm Marianne. And I'm Dan. See you next week.